Natural landscapes, regeneration of them, particularly after bushfires, and looking for new markets and opportunities is what Adrian Drew is all about today. I'm just outside of Buxton in Victoria. Adrian, how are you, mate? G'day, Tim. How are you going there, mate? Now, you've got a degree in landscape architecture. Yeah. Then you took a train and you went north to Kalgoorlie, you got a job in the super pit, and you yep. ended up working for Rio Tinto in the mining industry in Parabadu. Absolutely, that's right. And now you've ended up back in Victoria looking at regeneration of landscape and using all of the skills that you got in both your degree and your working in mining industry to rehabilitate land and create a sustainable income for your family. 100%, that's exactly right. <laughs> now where we're standing is pretty significant, isn't it? About 11 years ago, you wouldn't have wanted to be standing here, would you? No, we looked at this land, uh, well, it was back in 2010 when we first bought the land. It was 100 acres of pine stumps. So to the, um, to the uh, left of us over here, it was completely barren. It was all burnt out. There was a pine forest that was logged three years before the 09 fires. We looked at it and we said, we'll take it on. Now the 09 fires was Black Saturday. That's right. When you arrived here and you took it on, there was no topsoil, it was eroded. Yeah. There was some remnants of some large stumps and pretty much the rest of it had all washed out to sea, hadn't it? That's right. There was already erosion in some of these gullies here, about five or six foot deep after one year. There was nothing holding the ground together, no topsoil, uh, no plants. Um, in fact, the top of this hill we thought it would never ever come back. It was just a, a white ash bed. It, the fire had burnt so hot that there was no life left there at all, nothing. So to try and regenerate this farmland so mm. that it can create an income for you mm. and your family, yep. you looked to natural sequence principles and you've divided the farm up into three sections, is that correct? So obviously in the upper part of this hill, we're building fertility high up in this agroforestry area. Uh, the middle area is where you exploit that fertility, so that could be where you do cropping, um, pastures, you know, for grazing, what have you. And then the bottom third is where you recover that fertility and then you move it back up to the top and you start recycling. Well, let's have a look at those three zones and have a look at how you can cleverly exploit all of them to generate a profit. So Adrian, all of these trees, they're all about 11 years old, mate. Yeah. Now the right. plan is to use these for agroforestry and you've already been through and thinned once, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. These were thinned out about 10 years ago. Um, especially up on the hillsides here. Um, in the gully that's below us, uh, we haven't thinned that area. I thought I'd keep that thicker just to slow down the flows. Because um, obviously in the, agro in the forest area at the top, we're building a fertility, we're slowing the flows down. And this principle can be applied in many areas of our cleared landscape. Once there was a saying by the ancient Tao Chinese that said, if you clear the forest at the top of the catchment, you basically stuff the rest of the catchment below it. And in many areas of this district, um, that's definitely the case. But you don't have to not use the top of the forest, you just have to not completely clear it. That's right. And so what we'll take on in this area is to selectively uh, harvest some of these trees. Um, we'll also interplant these trees with more biodiversity, so actually mix the canopy uh, up a little bit. Now this is an interesting thing, you were telling me off camera that there's a lot of evidence now that the original Australian forests were only about 4 or 5% gum trees. Yeah, that's correct. So in a wetter forest landscape, which a lot of these forests were in ancient times, most of the forests were predominantly uh, pines, palms and evergreens. Uh, the eucalypts were only a very small amount, about 4%. Now you have to start thinking, well, why is there so many eucalypts now? And is that not native and natural? Yep. Well, it's basically telling you it's a response to the conditions that have happened over this landscape over time. And I'd say that what's happened is that there's been a lot of burning regimes happening in this land over time and obviously since European settlement that's increased a fair bit. And, and what, catastrophic fires as well, really hot fires. Absolutely, that's right. Um, but prior to that, uh, when this landscape was wetter, this is rainforest country and there are still pockets of beach rainforest around here. So your plan is to bring back more of those rainforest trees and plant them in here to try and lower the temperature of the soil Mm. and reduce the fire risk because it's all about the temperature of the soil in a gum forest, isn't it? Well, it's probably more about the temperature, not only the soil, but also the, uh, the atmosphere as well. So if a fire did come through here and the forest is wetter and cooler and the air's cooler, it won't burn as severely as a dry forest. So what our plan is to do now is to, and we've already started this, is to interplant the perimeter of our forestry area with deciduous trees, which transpire more uh, moisture during extreme heat 
and they take that heat away uh, and they cool the landscape and they create a wetter landscape. All right? Whereas the gum trees, as we know, their leaves, they tend to hold on to the moisture within them. They have a high oil content and in extreme heat, that oil becomes volatile. You only need a spark and up the, up, you know, the whole thing goes. So the big message is up here in zone one, which is your higher zone, Adrian, is that just because you have a forest, it doesn't mean it can't return profitability to your farm. The second lesson is gum trees are good, but only when they're mixed in with other species as well. Mm -hmm. And the third message is we're creating and making all of this lovely fertility that's going to flow down the hill. That's right, exactly. Yeah, that, that feeds all your production areas where you, you basically make your day-to-day -day profit. Now, Adrian, we're coming down out of your primary forestry area at the top and we're into a pretty special little zone here. We've got three things going on. We've got contours, we've got a dam to capture fertility and release it that's working as part of those contours, and then we've got something pretty special that you've done with the batters on the side of your track as well. That is correct, Tim, absolutely. Well, let's go and have a look at those three things because they're all fascinating. Well, first off, mate, I reckon let's have a look at this dam over here. It's pretty special. Sure, let's do that. Yeah, so Tim, this, um, this dam is constructed in such a way it is a chain of ponds in its own right as well. So we've actually got three ponds in here uh, and they step the low flow of water all the way down to the bottom end. And the idea is that we create cells within the dam because I know that when I dozed out the bottom end of the dam, it's quite gravelly. It means I can hold smaller bodies of water within the dam itself um, and I can use that as I need it. So as you can see, Tim, this dam is not full. Here we are in February. Um, usually this dam is completely empty at this time of the year, but this dam is a little bit special. This dam actually does form part of the long contour at this level here in the landscape, which is just below our fertility accumulation area. And what it does is actually, it holds water, but then slowly releases it out through the landscape below. So we're actually slowing down the flows off the land. Um, we're also broadcasting the flows as well, because in 2022, this dam filled completely full and the water actually spilled out along the contours either side of the dam onto the ridges and then created this big massive meander in the landscape, rehydrating a larger area, obviously. The other thing it can do is uh, it does collect fertility like most farm dams do, but it has the ability to broadcast that fertility out over a much larger area as well, um, which is beneficial for your production areas below, below the, such areas. So because this dam is long, it doesn't get as much sunshine as most dams do. So it means that your evaporation rate, which is one of the biggest losses in farm dams, it's minimized. And if you do plant trees around the edge, as we've done here, and add other deciduous trees as well to cool the air around it, you get less losses in your water supply as well. So because you've built the farm dam, not as a standalone dam, but as part of a contour, you're quite happy to lose that water out over time because it's doing the job that a pump would normally do with an irrigation system. Plus, you've also got more opportunity to shade it with trees along the side, so you've got less eutrophication problems in the water, even though it's got nutrient in it. Yes, that's right, Tim. Also, because this uh, dam is also held higher in the landscape, we can actually siphon out of it and actually feed a series of water troughs for stock down below, keeping the stock out of the dam and keeping its natural filtering system happening around it intact, which is very important to stop sedimentation. So Adrian, this contour is warming my heart because a lot of the contours that I've seen when people do natural sequence practices are these tiny little things that you'd trip over on a four wheel bike and all that sort of thing. You've turned this contour into a multi-purpose farm track for forestry, for access to your land, for firefighting, and it's still doing the job. Absolutely, that's right. What you can do now with these larger contours is actually have the ability to not only capture the fertility, but if you get the tall grasses growing in here, such as Phragmites and you know, things like that, you can actually harvest those grasses, which is holding the fertility, and actually cut bale them, because you can get a tractor through there, and cut them up to the high ground to start recycling the fertility and create more complexity in your compounds, better animal health, the benefits are amazing. Plus you're also saving yourself a thousand years of fertility depletion as well from the top. So you're using natural sequence practices with a very pragmatic and utilitarian mindset. Absolutely, and it's all based on the Australian landscape science. So your lessons of contouring have been used as well with your batter. Now normally you come off 
the natural landscape and you cut a batter down to a drain at the side of your track and then you come up to your track so that you don't get water on your track. That's right. But you've employed contours in your batter and you reckon that's solving a number of problems for you as well? Well, it certainly is. It slows down the water flow coming off the batter. It gives a chance for the plants to grow because now there's water available in the batter itself. So you're stabilising the bank much quicker? Absolutely, and all the roots and everything else that goes in there. I can even see a little oak tree growing in there. And then what happens is that you only get clean water now flowing into your gutter instead of it carrying sediment because it's all dropped out in the contour, which means your pipes don't block up. So Adrian, here we are in zone two. And it looks like things are getting bushier, mate. But once again, when we come into this area, you've got plants here that are actually a cash crop for you, like this mint bush. That's right. So this is a native mint, and you can dry this and sell it as a commodity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And there is a market for this sort of stuff, isn't there? Yeah, so fine restaurants, uh, they'll stock this sort of stuff for the, on their menu. Um, also, it's good medicinally. It's got a very high menthol content. Um, if you have a bit of this fresh leaf, steeped in a uh, hot tea with some honey it'll cure uh, colds and uh, flus quite quickly the fertility that's been generated from the higher areas from our forestry areas is now coming down here to get exploited because we're actually taking this product off the farm but the thing is between each of these rows these rows are all um, cut on contour we're actually creating fertility bank both top and bottom so that fertility from these mini sort of uh, fertility rows is actually feeding the plants below it again for the next row now, Adrian, the second zone doesn't just have bush foods if people were starting to get a bit nervous there about the content. We've also got some cattle happily grazing in the second zone as well. And you've got some very interesting paddock design. You've got some fertility of both above and below each paddock and the fences are on contours, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So with the paddocks in this production area, this is the area where we're going to be exploiting the fertility from the forestry area at the top. Yep. We basically create a series of paddocks which are fenced on contour uh, around the hillsides as we go down, move the water and start creating this induced meander of water flow across the land and rehydrate it. Now there's something else worth commenting on while we're in the paddock here. It's half past 12, it's the 15th of February 2024. Mm. It's a reasonably warm day, middle of summer in Australia and we still got some dew on the ground. That's right, yeah. And that's because of the environment, the microclimate that you're setting up on this particular site, isn't it? That's right, and as land managers, that's our greatest asset, is to actually retain the daily water cycle within a certain area that we've got, and also uh, use that water to grow more plants so we can continue that, um, that moderation of the heat that plants do uh, produce by you know, converting the sun's energy into a product and compound that we can use, which is the plant and the sugars and everything else. But in the meantime, they also take away the heat during the day because they transpire while they're photosynthesizing and growing. That heat's taken away, it cools the landscape during the day, and at night, the water recondenses back on the leaves on the plants, and the heat um, is actually released from that water, from the condensed water. So we actually get a warmer landscape at night. So the dew is worth quite a bit of rain every year, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it can be worth up to 100, 100 mils of rain in certain areas. And I will point out, there is some blackberry growing in amongst this grass, um, but that is something that you are managing on an ongoing basis, and it will slowly disappear from the landscape over time as you manage the, the paddocks. That's right. And by having these plants here, and they could be classed as weeds, they're basically telling you that there's an imbalance or a deficiency in your land. So if you start asking, well, why are those plants there? then you'll start getting the answers. And if they're spiny and really thorny, um, they'll be telling you that we're trying to repair the landscape. They're probably gonna be inedible as well, which means get away, I'm trying to do my job, rebuild that fertility, so the edible plants like your grasses can start moving back in. And they're the conditions that these plants create. And we're starting to see that in this paddock here. Absolutely, it's right in front of you. So the bottom of your grazing paddocks in zone two, Adrian, mm. it's also got contours on it. You're building the fertility and you're not planting any trees on the contour. You're just running the fence along the top. Yeah, so what we're doing here is all the fertility that's come off the paddock, anything that's come out of the paddock is filtered here and captured. Yep. Once again, because it's a wide contour, we can go along and harvest the tall grasses that grow in here over time, 
and feed them up at the top of the paddock and recycle that fertility for the animals. Um, the other thing to note with these contours is never plant trees at the very top of the bank because when you do, you start creating a vertical um, barrier that can actually cause a scour point in the top of the bank because it, all the energy now goes into that one point rather than keeping it all the way along nice and even and level. Um, and the final thing is below the contour, you can see here there's quite a lot of vegetation growing below it. So this is the area now where the water that's caught in here can actually move through this contour through the topsoil zone and pick up all the fertility generated by these trees below it and start feeding the next paddock. So Adrian, disposing of organic matter is also something that you use these contours for as well, but there's a few rules with them. You put some stuff in the contour and some stuff downstream of the contour. Yeah, that's right. You want to have these contours working as efficiently as possible. So if we look at two fertility types, there's soluble fertility and insoluble. So soluble fertility can go in the contour and that's stu um, stuff such as uh, worm teas, compost teas, um, some manures as well. Just put them straight in here. So people have horses and they're scraping the horse paddocks of manure, they can actually dump them straight in the contour channel. They can, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and that way the water will move that fertility through the topsoil layer around the entire side of the hill area below and feed all your plants below. But you've put a lot of trimmings and uh, bush mulch on the lower side of the contour and you haven't filled the contour with that. That's right. So we put the hard fertility and soluble stuff below the contour because what happens is that that fertility will slowly uh, leach out over time and the water coming from the contour will pick that up and move it downhill. Adrian, it's like we're in a little patch of oasis here. This is just a beautiful spot on your farm with beautiful overhead coverage, but also some really interesting plants and action down below. This is your recapture zone. Absolutely. This is where we uh, capture all our fertility. Everything that's come off our entire place comes down to this low spot, which is here on the land. <clears throat> it gets a chance to uh, have filtered throughout all the gullies and all the, the reed beds and all the plants above it. So much so that the water that used to run clay down this gully here around the time of the fires now is completely clean when it comes down here because it's gone through that filtering process. In fact, you can even drink it. It's the sweetest water I've ever had. But then you've got some interesting plants just below it that are doing further treatment on the water. That's right. So by creating a water body a little bit higher up, the water moves through this structure and actually creates a thing called positive water pressure or, you know, recharge, you've got water coming out. And what happens there is that certain plants like grasses really uh, adapt very well to that condition. In this case, we've got garnia growing down there. There's also a couple there behind us growing in the um, pond itself. And they're another filtering mechanism. So this contour is creating that condition so those plants can filter again further. So despite the fact that you've got forestry going on, you've mm. got some gourmet bush food stuff going on yeah you've got your meat production going on yeah and dairy the water coming off this land is crystal clear that's right and so the benefit of the, the benefits the neighbor gets is clean water not carrying sediment so they don't have to you know unblock their dam all the time um and yeah they've got the cleanest water that they can utilize however appropriate People can get in touch with you if they need to. I'll put a link in the description. Um, so if you're interested in having a chat to Adrian about a project, he does help people with natural sequence projects. So you're not on your own. Adrian is here to help. Yeah. Mate, thank you very much for your time today. It's been brilliant to look around your farm. We've got to understand that this is very much a work in progress, like many of your clients' properties are, mm. but we can see steps along the way as to where you've come, where you've come from and where you're going to. That's right. And the only time you really find out if, is if you've actually done it well, is that if it's operating automatically, really. Yeah, and some aspects of this property are now starting to operate automatically, aren't they? That's right, exactly. Yep. Well, well done, mate. Guys, if you like this kind of content, don't forget, hit the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up. Plenty more on timthompson.ag. And I'll speak to someone else interesting, hopefully, next week.